Yeah, the uh, computer personality thing that was in 1996. I wasn't aware that it's still making the rounds. Uh, but anyway, um, I think we benefit from the uh, open internet in a strategy that we call open response and open recovery, uh, the uh, detail of which is in digitalministry.tw. But in short, I think uh, the open internet allowed a participatory accountability system on mask rationing, on making sure that collective intelligence surfaces that Whistleblowing from Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan starting last December, not this January, uh, where we can get the SARS 1.0, uh, which is the 2003 collective traumatic memory uh, center operation procedures uh, rolled on uh, in January, even before we have the first local transmission cases. And from that onward, I think another key thing with the open internet is thanks to the social media, we share those very pro social messages, such as wear a mask to protect yourself from your your own and washed hands, which connects hand sanitation and um, the mask use. And also, when we roll out physical distancing, we say, when you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus away. And when you're outdoor, keep two of those Shiba Inus away. And all of these um, ideas we're spreading uh, have a, a much more joyful, higher transmission value, if you would, uh, than the conspiracy theories. So everybody remains calm and connected, even in the time of pandemic. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I think uh, the digitalization, uh, the campaign promises of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen four years ago, namely broadband as a human right, has really paid dividends uh, in Taiwan in this particular COVID situation. Um, because all the SMEs, all the pharmacies, all the convenience stores, and so on, <clears throat> have a um, very good connection quality to the rest of the society. And everywhere in Taiwan, it's equal access. Uh, we designed so that even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, you're still guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second for video live streaming both ways for just 16 euros a month, unlimited data. data. Uh, otherwise, it's my fault. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so this basic promise made sure that even when uh, we're uh, during the pandemic, for example, people can see uh, all the nearby pharmacies and so on. This is contributed by citizen uh, technologists, this is the mask rationing map, so that people who queue in line even can check uh, with their phone uh, of the mask availability of that particular pharmacy and see that people queuing before them swipe their national health card and get maybe nine medical masks uh, per two weeks during the ration. And then they can check whether this um, is function as intended. And if it doesn't, work or if it breaks in some places, they would just call the hotline 1922 and be connected to a call center that will then, through the idea of open government, uh, amplify their suggestions to the rest of the society the very next day. So we have this daily live stream by the quint, uh, by the five medical officers. So for example, back in April, when a young boy called saying, oh, you're rationing our mask, or oh, I get this pink medical mask, I don't want to wear it to school. Uh, the very next day, the, the quint, the five medical officers, all wore pink medical masks. And because of this, this this become a kind of fashion statement. You see the online SMEs and so on all adapted their branding and color their branding pink. Uh, and so suddenly the um, boy become the most hit boy in the class because only he has the color that the heroes wear. And even the heroes heroes because the medical officer, the Mr. Chen Shijong said, uh, actually Pink Panther was his childhood hero. And so it became a kind of fashion statement during our pride parade uh, and things like that. And all this helps the SMEs to strive because they can uh, reach through this kind of new normal fashion branding and so on and reach to a very wide audience and get uh, assured that all of them have pretty good broadband access regardless. Yeah, we, we work with uh, Facebook uh, before the pandemic on another demic, uh, the infodemic uh, issue, uh, because our presidential election was in January. Uh, so like the pandemic followed immediately uh, after the presidential election. And what we have found uh, in both the infodemic, which we countered with no takedown, and the pandemic, which we countered with no lockdown, um, is that if we make sure that the social sector as the mask map uh, example shows, do the data collection, 
and most of the data processing, and also set the data norms. So that is like a distributed ledger, more than 140 different um, copies, uh, including voice assistants and chatbots and so on, are available to track the mask's uh, whereabouts. And then uh, it will create a very strong social norm. And the state will then uh, work with, for example, with Facebook, on just ensuring those norms are observed in a truly multi-stakeholder fashion. Uh, on the other hand, if the state sees as our role to set the norms, or if the Facebook <laughs> sees this as their role to set the norms, then the society feels uh, that the data are being collected in the name of counter infodemic or counter pandemic. And that's, that never goes anywhere, right? People will, um, of course, very reasonably um, want to know the privacy as well as cybersecurity guarantees of those new data collection methods. So I think um, I do agree uh, with the principle of uh, this free flow of data, but I think uh, add to that is the idea that those data are being collected uh, and produced by people. And this has precedent as well, because in a liberal democracy as, as we are, um, we, we don't say that journalists and their editors are just text collectors, text workers and text makers and text um, pro uh, processors, right? Uh, there is a journalistic norm. Uh, and we say in Taiwan, starting last year, instead of media literacy in our basic education curriculum, we say media competence, uh, acknowledging fully that all the primary schoolers, maybe some of them have more Instagram followers than I do. And so because of that, our media workers uh, themselves and need to be educated uh, in the way of how a journalist approach text. And so if these uh, ethics and norms around text Text could be transferred to the data realm, then we do have a thriving social sector that could then communicate the norm around data collection. And I think our COVID uh, success is largely due to uh, making sure that people understand where the data is going, how the data is processed, and can co-create in the data pro processing uh, abilities so that we do not need to collect any new data that we were not collecting before the pandemic in order for the counter COVID uh, work uh, to happen. And so I think that is also one angle, a addition perhaps uh, to Simon's uh, main argument. So uh, radical transparency, meaning transparency at the root. Um, for example, all the meetings that I chair, uh, including interviews with journalists and lobbyists, uh, are recorded and published uh, into the commons uh, as either a transcript or as a video online. And so this made sure that people understand not only the what of policies, but the how of policy making and the why of policy making. Why are we even considering these policies in the first place? And this also engages the collective intelligence in ways that we have not seen before, because everybody can just call me uh, and say that, Minister, you're wrong about this in your previous meeting, and I have a better idea. And so this also fosters uh, social innovation. Um, for example, uh, when we're designing the triple stimulus voucher, the TSV, uh, which is a the simple idea to reduce to reduce uh, the friction that people want to, you know, start re-engaging in the post-COVID um, situation because we reached the um, kind of critical mass on the physical vaccine around June and uh, people restarted uh, their um, visit to night markets and uh, those catering businesses and so on. So we want to uh, encourage people to spend more on face-to-face gatherings. Uh, and uh, because of that, we design it so that if you spend uh, using the credit card, but only in a kind of outdoor shopping setting, um, 100 US dollars, uh, then you can redeem actually two thirds of that back on a nearby friendly automated teller machine, uh, and which is in cash. So you're likely to, to spend it again. And this has been quite successful. Actually, the revenue of retail and catering this August and September has reached the highest since the 1999, actually. Uh, and so our production capacity also recovered. The export orders have grown 13% and last August. But this is because um, all the convenience store, all the supermarkets and non-markets and so on, um, just uh, called me and say, we want to join on this too. And uh, just make the triple stimulus vouchers uh, quadruple or quintuple, uh, or like many times more <laughs> by offering their own discounts and by offering their own ways to, for example, you can choose to dedicate that two-thirds 
to a not-for-profit organization uh, of your choice. So instead of drawing it from the ATM, you can type in the donation code for a charity, and then the, the stimulus vouchers uh, reward goes to that charity. And that is from a social innovation lab visitor uh, to my office, because my office is literally a park. Anyone can walk in and say, hey, minister, I have seen the transcript of uh, your previous meeting, but I have a different idea, and I would really like uh, the Truth of Stone voucher to uh, contain this way to work with social entrepreneurs and so on. So this is literally my office, and anybody can just uh, walk here and have uh, like 40 minutes of my time. Um, in our um, national digitalization plan, uh, digitization is just the first pillar. It talks about the infrastructure broadband as human rights, uh, 5G that uh, goes first to the rural, indigenous, and remote islands, but that's just the first pillar. The other three pillars in the DIGI program <coughs> are innovation, governance, and inclusion. Uh, and uh, I see there's as a kind of linear progression. We make the infrastructure of digitization work because we want to foster innovations. And the innovations, in turn, foster this cross-sectoral partnership around governance and data normals. And finally, that is to include the people, um, including women's in entrepreneurs, Ms. Me's, and so on, social entrepreneurs. Uh, we call the social entrepreneurs uh, who originally may be charities or co-ops or, or, and so on, but through the training programs and the peer-to-peer -peer learning, they enhance their resilience and become like very visible. Uh, and we do actually prefer uh, the, like the buying power program if a large enterprise or large organization integrate um, those um, social entrepreneurs products and services into their supply chain then I personally go out and give them a award uh, and or the presidential hackathon which encourages this kind of cross-sectoral collaboration and um, every year our, uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen goes out and give five winning teams the trophy. The trophy is a shape um, of the island. And then if you turn on the micro projector underneath, it shows Dr. Simon handing you the trophy, promising whatever you did the last three months, it could be about improving water use efficiency. It could be about remote telecare and so on. That will become public policy in the next 12 months with all the regulation personnel as well as budget required. And this is a very strong incentive for the social innovator then to figure out a way to work with existing ecosystem players in a way that is kind of like a moonshot from the individual social entrepreneur's uh, point of view. But because of this power of the presidential hackathon, then it gets translated like fast track warp speed into uh, public policy uh, within 12 months. I think uh, the executive power as a hackathon award, that really excites me. Thank you. Thank you. Live long and prosper.